Hi folks, it's a gorgeous uh, sunny day out there. Um, absolutely gorgeous. Sun shining bright. I want to make a video concerning uh, BB Warfields, the formation of the cannon. It's really, really, really good what I've been reading. And I uh, just want to share it with you. So, this is the book, um, The Works of Benjamin Warfield, Revelation and Inspiration, Volume 1. Um, I've got the 10 volumes and uh, the brilliant books. And uh, I did a debate with a Muslim at Hyde Park, and it was on the formation of the cannon. And uh, I came back from that debate and did some did some more research. I read a few PhDs, read some books, uh, Kruger on the formation of the cannon, uh, read the early church fathers, and things were niggling with me. Things weren't sitting right because um, what I was finding in my research is that there were various lists. There was the li there was Origins list, which all the uh, canon was right early on accepted. But then you read quotes of Origin where there were certain disputes about certain books. Uh, so you have this early list, and then you have disputes about certain books. Here. So you have the whole New Testament accepted by Origin and then you have some books where he's questioning whether they're accepted or not so there was kind of anomalies there um, then you look at the early church fathers quotes and um, the quote in the gospels, the quote in Paul's epistles but then sometimes they might quote uh, the shepherd of Hermes or uh, the Didache and that kind of was a bit confusing and then um, you have um, the fact that there were debates like about the book of Revelation and stuff. So, so I did my research, I looked at the primary sources like the early church fathers and there were some anomalies there. And then I was doing some more research, started reading a few academic books and PhDs. I was not happy with the academic work that was being done because a lot of it um, from the evangelical side was seemed to be dealing with semantics uh, seemed to be dealing with various theories so Kruger's book deals with various theories about the formation of the canon and it wasn't giving me anything specifically detailed but this article by B.B. Warfield just gave me peace of mind uh, it's a brilliant article uh, it's there. It's called The Formation of the New Testament Canon. And he explains brilliantly and puts it all together and, make, and just makes sense. So, basically shows right at the beginning from the Bible that the New Testament was seen as the Word of God. Um, he, he quotes 2 Peter chapter 16. Uh, as saying, you know, Paul, he says, it is historically evident from the beginning, thus the Apostle Peter, writing in AD 68, speaks of Paul's numerous letters, not in contrast with other scriptures, in 2 Peter chapter 3.16. He notices that in 1 Timothy chapter 5 verse 18, that Paul quotes Deuteronomy 25.4, and Luke chapter 10 verse 7 so, so Paul is quoting Luke next to Deuteronomy so obviously uh, seeing it as scripture um, and then he he shows um, that um, that the apostles words was to to be seen as the word of God 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 2 
2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 15. So he, he makes a very convincing case that right in the New Testament itself there is this authoritative sense of, of books that were there already right at the beginning. Then, in a magisterial way, he just brings together some historical notes showing that there was a firm sense of a canon right after the Apostles. So he says, the, page 453, the earliest name given to the new section of scripture was framed on the model of the name by which what we know as the Old Testament was then known, just as it was called the Law and the Prophets and the Psalms, or the Hagrok Hagei Grapha, or more briefly the Law and the Prophets, or even more briefly still, the Law. So the enlarged Bible was called the Law and the Prophets with the Gospels and the Apostles. So Clement of Alexandria, Strom, uh, volume 6, verse 2, 88, Tertullian, Day, Praise, Hay, 36, or more briefly, the Law and the Gospel, so Claudius, Apollonius, and Irenaeus, while the new books were called the Gospel and the Apostles, or more briefly, the Gospel. The earliest name for the new Bible, with all that it involves, is to its relation to the old and briefer Bible, is traceable as far back as Ignatius, AD 115, who makes use of it repeatedly in, in uh, Ad Philad 5 and S-M-I-R-N 7. In one passage he gives us a hint of the controversies which the enlarged Bible of the Christians aroused among the Judaizers, Philad 6. When I heard some say, saying, he writes, unless I find it in the old books, I will not believe the gospel. On my saying it is written, they answered, that is the question. To me, however, Jesus Christ is the old book, his cross and death and resurrection, and the faith which is by him unveiled undefiled the old books by which I wish your prayers to be justified. The priests indeed are good, but the high priest better. Etc. Here Ignatius appeals to the gospel of scripture and the Judaizers object receiving from him the answer in effect which Augustine afterwards formulated in the well known saying of the New Testament lies hidden in the old and the old testament is first made clear in the new. So he, he, he gives a pretty good convincing argument there showing that right at the beginning there was a clear understanding of a new a, a new testament as as well as a, a old testament but then what I find really helpful in this article is B.B. Warfield doesn't shirk um, some real difficult intellectual questions he mentions that there were some books where they were disputed, and this is the interesting point. He makes a very strong case that right at the beginning, because of um, what the New Testament says it about itself, and what some of the early church fathers talk about the new, the, the, the gospel, there was a clear understanding of a canon, a New Testament canon. But then, he points out that there were various difficulties in copying. Um, sometimes certain places didn't have all the books. And when you think about it, this just makes perfect sense. You know, they didn't have the printing press. So when books were being copied, uh, it was quite expensive to have massive volumes uh, created. So some areas wouldn't have all all the New Testament and so there were disputes and difficulties about certain books but he makes another interesting point is that not all the books uh, sorry he, he makes a very interesting point where he notices that the disputes about the books was not unanimous it was only a minority it was only a minority at various places within uh, the ancient world. The majority accepted the books. So what I learned from this is that it was not one church or one man that stated that the New Testament was the Word of God. 
what has happened here is that the New Testament has stood out to the church as the Word of God and the church has had to accept it and it proves the divine inspiration and authority of the New Testament that it was copied all over the ancient world never fully copied properly in some areas where some places didn't have the books then there were other uh, false books and yet amazingly we have this collation of the New Testament which stands out as a monument as the Word of God so I find found B.B. Warfield's, B.B. Warfield's article brilliantly crystal clear um, very scholarly I know the bit where he quotes to Peter in the academic world today would not be accepted at all um, but I think that when we're in different academic climates we're, we're in his day he was quite skeptical but the last 150 years it's, we lived in we live in a very ultra skeptical uh, society uh, academic world uh, so I, 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 I don't take the cynicism uh, that an academic would when B.B. Uh, Warfield quotes to Peter and uh, I think it's legitimate to do that um, because there is evidence to suggest that that to Peter is an, a, an early book so but the point that I want to say is that B.B. Warfield's article was very crystal, crystal clear brings together some of the main issues uh, and gets to the point and he makes one last point which is significant which is very different from a lot of academic talk today he talks about the definition of canon to the early church fathers and for them they saw canon as a rule book the Old Testament was their rule as in law and the New Testament was a new rule as in law and um, with that that is a completely different idea of canon and fits perfectly well in its historical context and gives you a, a historical methodology to study the sources much better than a lot of academic work that's being done today I've read a, quite a bit of academic work recently and um, I've been frustrated with the evangelical scholarship even with the people that I really admire, I've been frustrated because it just didn't doesn't get to the brass tacks, doesn't get to the main issues. Whereas this short article pulls it all together in a very simple way. Uh, another article that I read, which I, I found helpful, but not as helpful as that article, is uh, by F. F. Bruce. Uh, he wrote. Uh, a large book on the canon. Um, I think it's called uh, the canon and the parchments or something. Um, and if you want to read a book discussing the scholarly, different scholarly views, uh, Dr. Krug, 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 Kruger, um, if you go on canon fodder, um, that's very He's a very helpful author. Um, I've studied writers like Charles, who was, a, uh, I think, a, another scholar called Barton or Benton. And, and I've read a few PhDs recently. But I found this article really, really helpful. I hope this has been interesting and helpful for you. So, um, yeah, so B.B. Warfield, The Formation of the Canon best article to read on that topic. Uh, I, I don't know if you can buy the 10 volumes of B.B. Warfield to get that one bit or if you could find it on the internet somewhere but it's well worth reading and it's very succinct and um, I found it very helpful and it's, it's dealt with quite a few issues and helps me to understand uh, better to defend the faith in that area. Alright, thank you for listening. And God bless you. Don't forget my website is jasonburnspreacher.com. 
I have another website called um, Royal Blood Ministries and uh, you can get me on Twitter at jasonburnspreacher.com uh, my own Twitter, my own Facebook and also there's a Royal Blood Ministries Twitter, Facebook and website which you can get on my YouTube channel, Jason Burns YouTube channel under the video title uh, Big Change is Coming Alright, take care and God bless, bye now